um, the musculature presentation, right? I went through talking about the thick and thin filaments. Um, had I showed you any animations at that point? Okay. Um, so before I make this full screen, I just want to get to the point where we were a little bit ago, <laughs> last time, I mean. Um, and then I want to move to somewhere else to show you something. Uh, so I showed you, did we even get to this? Yes. We did get to that? Um, no, we didn't. We didn't talk about this stuff. You're lying. Um, this picture here probably looks like this picture here. Okay. So, um, uh, did I show you this picture? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, the way I have it set up currently in the, the presentation, I would go on to show you a couple of other uh, things, and I'll go back and get those in a second, but actually what I want to do first is move over here for a second. Um, so last time we were talking about um, uh, thick filaments and thin filaments, the sarcomere and the myofibril, that kind of stuff. And so uh, to continue on with that, uh, before we go on to the next part of what how the book handles this, um, I do want to introduce this idea. Um, the way that contraction occurs is through um, what's called sliding filaments. So the thin filaments and thick filaments are overlapping within the sarcomere. And uh, so sort of like I have my hands partially interlocked here, um, the filaments are overlapping each other. And they slide across each other, which makes the sarcomere shorter. And as each sarcomere within the myofibril gets shorter, and therefore all of the myofibrils get shorter, the whole uh, muscle fiber will contract. And so I want to go to um, this website, uh, which has a little animation about this idea of, fl of sliding filaments. Now, I just clicked on a link in the presentation uh, which you can use to get to it, but also I've put that link in uh, the Blackboard section for this, uh, the first part of the muscle unit that we're dealing with. So this sliding filament model animation link right here will take you to this page here. Um, now this page is uh, from a textbook publisher, McGraw-Hill, um, and it's actually something that's been on the, the web for a long time. I've been using it um, for the decade that I've been teaching here. And obviously it's, it's older than that because there's, I'll mention some changes later on and there's evidence of changes that predate me using it even. But um, it says on the website that it goes with this human anatomy book by those authors. But actually, um, McGraw-Hill has been using this animation and has had it on a website like this for a very long time, and it used to be tied to a different a and textbook that they had. I don't know that much about McGraw-Hill. It might be that that used to be their main a and textbook that they were selling, and then it fell out of favor, or the authors of that book decided not to, to maintain it and, and keep making new versions, or they got a pitch from another author to make a different type of book, and they decided to go with that. But they kept this animation, and now it's technically associated with a new book. Not that it's, it's any different from before. So uh, let me play this animation. Uh, it has a voiceover, which uh, the speakers... <coughs> oh, uh, I might think the speakers are on. I see a little light on them. Uh, I'll adjust the volume if I need to. But uh, it's a really short little animation, and... I'll let it play through, and then I'm going to talk about it in some detail afterwards. In a relaxed muscle, actin and myosin myofilaments lie side by side, and the H zones and I band are at maximum width. During contraction, the actin and myosin myofilaments interact. The actins are pulled toward the center of each myosin myofilament. As a result, the sarcomere is shortened. In the fully contracted muscle, the ends of the actin myofilaments overlap. 
The H zones disappear and the I band becomes very narrow. Okay, so that's the whole animation. But um, let me uh, just back this up and I can use a slider and kind of make the filament slide across each other. And that's what's happening when the muscle contracts and then it relaxes and it contracts and relaxes and so on and so forth. That's basically what's happening there. Um, but uh, before I talk about that, I just want to sort of use this as, for a second to review uh, or make sure that we covered things last time. Um, so we talked about the, actually the book calls it the Z-disc. Here it's called the Z-line, but those are the same thing. Um, who can define what the Z-disc is or the Z-line? Right, it's the boundary at the edge of a circumference. Okay. Um, why is the letter Z useful in referring to it? Yeah, so it refers to the zigzag shape of the fi fibers that make it up. Okay. Um, um, it doesn't move. I mean, it doesn't change its shape. It's just uh, as the thin filaments get pulled towards the center, the Z lines or Z discs on either side pull in. This animation obviously is showing you two sarcomeres side by side. So the middle one is sort of fixed in the middle of the image. Um, and then we see the two Z discs on either side pull in. Um, more realistically, uh, if you think about what's happening in the muscle, one end of the muscle is going to be fixed in position and the other end is going to be pulling towards it. And it would be kind of neat in this animation if they'd done that, that this Z-line on the side was fixed and this one pulled in towards it. And so as that pulls in, this sarcomere is going to also pull in and you see the whole thing sort of shrinking towards one side. That'd be more realistic sort of... Uh, representation of what's happening in the whole muscle. I mean, this isn't unrealistic, it's just that the frame of reference is centered on that center Z-disc, and that's really not how uh, muscles work. They have a fixation at one end that doesn't move and everything else slides towards it. But uh, the structure of the Z-disc doesn't change, it's just, you know, like a sliding wall that gets pulled along with the thin filaments. Okay. Um, so what is the A band? Say that again? So the bracket there is lined up exactly with the, the thick filament. Um, did we talk about what the A band was last time? We didn't? Okay. So it is, in fact, where the thick filament is, but it's called the A band because when you stain muscle tissue, it's the dark band of striations. And we use A to refer to it because it's the A in the word dark. Um, what do you think the I band is then? Yeah, so the I in I band refers to the I in the word light. So A band and I band is just the alternating dark and light bands of the striation. Now, you can see here that the, the bracket that's uh, pointing out the A band in either of these lines up perfectly with the thick filament, with the minus. Um, and so the A I band is just the spacing between it. So the dark band, the I band, is where we have thick filament and the I band or the light band is where we don't have thick filament. Students will often try to say the A band is where the thick filament is and the I band is where the thin filament is. It's not really a correct way of talking about it because the thick filament and the thin filament overlap. Okay? And so there's thin filament in the A band. Uh, there's thin filament in the I band also, but the fact that it's in both of those bands um, doesn't make the I band specifically where the thin film is. 
the reason why the A band is dark is because the thick filament, myosin, being a thick protein, reacts more with the stain, and so it stains that part of the cell darker. Um, and then the I band doesn't have any myosin in it, and so it stains lighter because there's nothing there. Um, the H zone, the bracket within the A band, is the part of the A band where there is no thin filament. And it's actually a slightly lighter region in the dark band. It, you're not going to see that standing out in the stained tissue that we looked at. But if you have a very well stained section at a high magnification, you can actually visualize it. But we won't be able to see that. Yeah. So what make of the, the I band? So the I band is, by definition, just where we do not have the thick filament. So as you can see there, there's a little bit of the thin filament and the Z-disc is in there too. Uh, there's another protein that's not highlighted here that uh, <coughs> connects the thick filament to the Z-disc. But it's not in the picture here, but technically that would be in the I-band also. But the proteins that are in the I-band are all small, thin proteins, and so they don't pick up as much stain, so they don't stain as dark as my myosin. And so you can see a different difference in the staining between those two bands. That's all it is. Um, so when the sarcomere contracts, the thick filament has these little head things. I did pull out my little bendy things and make the golf club thing, right? Yeah. Um, so those head pieces on myosin actually move, and they are what push the thin filament across the thick filament until the thin filament meets in the middle and the H zone disappears. Okay, now the thick filament and thin filament are completely over overlapping. Everywhere that we have myosin, we have thin filament. Okay. So there's no H band uh, in the middle with no overlap. Okay. Um, and in the uh, voiceover, it says towards the end, that the H zone disappears. Um, and the reason why the H zone disappears, and I think it says this in the voiceover, is because the actin, the thin filament from either side, they overlap a little bit in the middle. They meet up in the middle. Um, they've changed this animation slightly as I've been using it over the years. And it used to actually at this point, where it said the H zone disappears and the thin filaments overlap in the middle, a little. Um, circle would pop up over each of the spots where the thin filament from either side is overlapping. For whatever reason, they decided to remove that little dot, but um, it is still true. And I think the voiceover still says it. Um, so the H zone disappears and the I band narrows. Okay. So since the thin filaments are pulling in from either side uh, and the Z disc is being pulled in um, closer to either um, <clears throat> a band, the I band ends up narrowing uh, the space between them. Now the voiceover doesn't actually say at the end, but they have a bracket here that says the A band remains unchanged. And I imagine this is uh, kind of getting at what I think uh, the animation must have originally said in the voiceover that the A band remains unchanged. Um, but as long as I've been using it, which is like 10 years, uh, it's never said that, but it has always had that pop up at the end uh, visually. And it's a funny point to make here. I don't know why they took it out, and bless you. Um, the A band does remain unchanged. The I band gets narrow, but the A band doesn't change its thickness at all. And that's because myosin doesn't change in doing this. Myosin's there and it remains its full length the whole time, all that happens is the head groups move. The thin filaments don't change either. They just slide in uh, and take up more space within the A band so that the I band gets narrower. So <clears throat> this is the basis of contraction. Okay. Now, I think yesterday I said that I was going to really try to kind of stay on the um, book's way of explaining all of this, and I've, I've broken that promise right now. Um, I really prefer, in explaining this, after talking about myosin and actin and then thin filament and thick filament, 
to jump to the sliding filament model because we just talked about these structures and I want you to see how they they play a part in how, what works here. Okay. Um, what the book actually does after that, after talking about those structures, what we ended with last time, is it goes on to talk about another aspect um, <clears throat> of what's going on with um, the whole uh, muscle fiber anatomy, I guess you could say. Um, and the book goes on to start talking about <clears throat> a concept called excitation contraction coupling. And I'll get to explain that soon enough. But what's important in explaining that, the anatomy behind it, is to start then talking about the connection between the nervous system and the muscles. And so here we see at the top of this image um, a nerve fiber, what we call an axon, coming in. Uh, that's represented in yellow, and at the end of the axon, it branches into a few endings, each of which connects directly to the um, muscle fiber. Um, <clears throat> wrapped around the axon, the kind of tannish looking things that are labeled myelin sheath, um, those are lipid rich insulating collars, if you will. So just like an electrical wire in the wall of the ceiling here has a rubber insulation around it so that uh, the electricity doesn't connect with anything outside of the wire. It keeps the electricity in the wire, so to speak. There's something similar to that around axons in the nervous system so that the electrical uh, <coughs> signal, which is carried by ions, stays within the nerve fiber. Okay? So that's what we see. In this chapter, they don't talk about the electrical properties of nerve fibers or muscles, but they refer to them quite a bit. And they'll talk about what's called an action potential. Now we'll understand what an action potential is in a lot more detail because that's explained in the nervous tissue chapter, which we're going to get to after we finish all the muscular stuff in a couple of weeks. Um, and uh, um, in this chapter, the representation of the action potential is usually a, um, come on, red lightning bolt arrow like we see here. And in fact, in the second one, you see that red lightning bolt arrow here, and they actually label it um, nerve impulse, which is sort of a general term that means essentially the same thing, but action potential is its formal name. At this point, for the, the sake of this chapter, we're just going to think of the action potential or nerve impulses. That's just an electrical signal, okay? and that's part of what's exciting the nervous, the muscle tissue. We talked about excitability at the beginning of uh, last time. And this is what's exciting the muscle tissue. Okay. Um, and it's why it's important at this point to consider how the nervous system interacts with the muscles. Okay. Now, I said that the end of the axon, which is called the axon terminal, axon terminal just means literally end of the axon, um, where it branches, those three branches all connect directly to the muscle fiber. That's actually a slightly misleading statement. Um, the axon terminal, which sort of enlarges into this, um, I don't know, I should say it here. Uh, some places will call this kind of bulging end to the axon, so the axon terminal might refer to it as the uh, synaptic end bulb. Uh, it's a bulb, it's a little enlargement at the end of the, the nerve fiber. And it doesn't actually physically connect directly to the muscle. Instead, there's a little gap between the end of the axon and the cell membrane of the muscle cell. And that's what's called a synapse. Um, 
there's actually kind of an interesting story behind the person, uh, the scientist that originally described uh, the connection between uh, nerve cells and their targets, whether it's muscles or other nerve cells or other stuff. Um, because it's a very, very small thing and it's very really hard to see back when it was originally described. Uh, microscopes were not powerful enough to see the actual gap between them. So uh, the story is kind of interesting in sort of the <clears throat> discussions and arguments that took place trying to explain what's happening here. Um, and the prevailing understanding, which turns out to be true, uh, was based on some logical arguments that were really pretty impressive at the time. But there is a little gap between the two. The electrical signal that we're talking about, the action potential, it travels along the length of the nerve fiber all the way to this end thing here, but there's not like a little spark of electricity that jumps from one to the other. Instead, that gap, that synapse there, is a place where a chemical signal can diffuse from one cell to the other. And uh, the nervous system we usually think of as having electrical signals in it, but more accurately, they're electrochemical signals because there's the electrical activity that I'm going to describe later on, which we're right now just calling the, the action potential. And then there are chemicals that are released and passed from one cell to the other. Uh, the little dots that we see here, or highlighted here, those are chemicals. They're called neurotransmitters. And they're released from axon terminals or synaptic end bulbs, whatever they're going to be called. Um, into that little gap called the synapse or synaptic cleft and they diffuse that very short distance which is measured in nanometers it's a very very small space they just diffuse across that and on the target cell in this case the muscle cell there are proteins which bind to the neurotransmitter they're receptors and when the neurotransmitter binds to it in this example that protein, that receptor, is an ion channel that opens up. Okay. So in this picture, over on this side, we have a closed ion channel that is not bound to anything. And here we have a channel that's bound to two dots representing our transmitter molecules. And it's open and allows something to pass through. And I just realized I forgot. Um, there is a, an error with this picture. Um, and I, I meant to put in a corrected version of it, but uh, let me just zoom on in on this. Uh, can anybody tell me what's wrong with this picture here? Hmm? What about the chemical that goes through it? What chemical is it? Well, what does NA stand for? Sodium, which is in fact the correct chemical that would go through there. But what you're saying is technically correct because they didn't properly represent what sodium is. What does it say there about sodium? That yeah, they claim that it's negatively charged in this picture. It's actually a positive ion. Okay. Um, so, sorry? I said those dummies. Yeah. Um, I was. You know, part of writing some of the chapters for this book, not this particular one, but the process of working with the art, dir uh, art director and art editor and the artists uh, was an imperfect process. Um, and so it's not, it doesn't surprise me terribly that it was missed, that this should actually be a positive sign here. Now, what I've done is I've just taken this picture and I've put it in uh, to a drawing program and I changed that to a positive sign. Um, I forgot, however, to put my fixed version of the picture in here. But I do have to make a point of it because this is the version that's in the book. Um, as I'm correcting some of these pictures, and I did some others for A and P2 chapters, um, <clears throat> I'm going to send them to the editors and say, uh, I've corrected these pictures. Uh, you should swap them out. Uh, but that's not going to help you because it's not going to happen this semester. But, uh, so just understand that sodium is in fact a positive ion. It is in fact what goes through the chap the channel there, but um, it's uh, misrepresented here as 
being negative. There's no such thing as NA negative. That's just a completely uh, erroneous representation of that ion. But um, <clears throat> the charged particle that is an ion that moves across the membrane there, that's what changes the electrical properties of the cell and generates the electrical signal that we call the action. Now there's two action potentials. There's an action potential in the nerve, and there's an action potential in the muscle. And you'll often hear the uh, action potential of the muscle just referred to as the muscle action potential, just to highlight that it's happening in the muscle cell. But the nerve fiber excites the muscle, and the muscle in its excited state is electrically active. And that's going to um, play an important role in um, causing contraction. Um, so uh, this jumps a little bit uh, away from the synapse. Oh, I didn't mention this. That's called the neuromuscular junction. It's a formal name for that specific connection. Um, the book talks about it. I just forgot to mention it. Um, but now I'm looking at um, some of the structure of the cells. Uh, the muscle cell itself. <laughs> to some degree, everything here, well, no. There's one new thing here, but most of everything else we've already talked about. There's the sarcolemma, which is a cell membrane. There's the um, smooth endoplasmic reticulum called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is wrapped around the uh, myofibrillum. Okay. All of that's been covered already. What's added to this is what's called the T-tubule. Some sources will call it the transverse tubule, which is what T stands for. Um, what that is, is it's part of the cell membrane, part of the sarcolemma that goes inside the cell and wraps directly around the myofibrils. And it becomes sort of associated with very specific parts of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, where we have a T-tubule and the thick ends of sarcoplasmic reticulum, which are called terminal cisternes, cisterna, cisterne, we'll have three of those together, which as a group are called a triad. As that electrical signal, that active potential travels along the sarcolemma, it will go down the T-tubules and get inside of the cell. And the electrical signal that's traveling through the T tube will cause changes in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and that will release calcium. And calcium is necessary for contraction. Now, um, <clears throat> as I've laid things out here, I, again, sort of following the way the book deals with this, um, I put all of this sort of anatomy stuff together, and I'm pretty sure all of this is in one section in the book uh, that starts with the structure of the muscle as an organ and goes through the uh, excitation-contraction coupling where it explains the connection between the nervous system and the muscle down to how the T-tubules get down inside of the muscle fiber. But to really understand that, we need to move on to understanding how contraction really works. And so this section here, which I've actually already gone to and started talking about, is getting at um, how contraction takes place. And the picture I have here for the sliding filament model, this is out of the next part of the book after it introduces the idea of excitation and contraction. But um, I want to talk about it first because it shows you what the thin and thick filaments are there for. Okay, so I'm not going to go through that again. We just did look at it. Instead, I want to move over to this section, which you can't see the title of this anymore, but it said the necessity of calcium. So um, as I was just talking about a second ago, um, we see here the neuromuscular junction. Uh, the action potential, the red arrow, lightning bolt arrow, gets here, and it causes release of the neurotransmitter which then binds to its receptor in the sarcolemma. And then what's new uh, compared to the picture we were just looking at is when that sodium positively charged ion enters into the cell, 
that generates a new action potential represented by another red lightning bolt arrow here, which travels along the sarcolemma and down the T-tubule. So this is the T-tubule here. The T-tubule comes up next to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now the way that they've drawn the sarcoplasmic reticulum here does not look like the triad arrangement that we just looked at, but that's what we're talking about here. This is one half of the triad, or one side of the triad. Within the sarcoplasmic reticulum, there are calcium ions. And when the action potential gets down into the T-tubule, that electrical signal causes release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay. And then what calcium does is it gets out into the sarcoplasm, which is just the special name for muscle cytoplasm, uh, and works its way into the spaces between the proteins in the myofibril where it will bind to a specific protein in the thin filament, which is called troponin. Now, the book does not make this particular point, but I do want to make the point. Um, troponin in the book is just represented as a um, sort of greenish circle there. But actually, troponin is a complex of proteins. Um, there are three parts of troponin. Uh, sorry. They are there are three subunits to troponin, and they are just designated by um, uh, letters. I actually can never remember what all three are actually called because I've never bothered to commit to a men's memory. But um, anyways. So troponin is a complex. It has a subunit that is referred to as C, and I remember that. Um, and then it has two other subunits, which I can't remember their particular designations, and it doesn't really matter. Um, it might, it's definitely not, but you know, if this is C, it might be B and A. It's not, I know that it's not. It might be like J and R or something like that. It doesn't really matter. The reason why I remember C is that C is the part of troponin that binds to calcium. That's why it's designated as subunit C. C corresponds to calcium. Then the other two, again, I don't remember exactly what they're called. I don't care. Uh, they're just other parts of the protein. But when calcium binds to troponin C, the entire troponin complex changes its shape, which forces um, this other protein that's wrapped around the actin called tropomyosin to move out of the way so that myosin can bind to actin directly. Okay. And then uh, the myosin heads hydrolyze ATP down to ADP in a phosphate and use that chemical energy to move and cause the thin filament to slide across the thick film, which is going to ultimately cause the um, muscle fiber to contract, and therefore the whole muscle will contract. Calcium has to be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum for uh, contraction to take place. Calcium is released because of the excitation, and calcium causes the contraction. So what links excitation and contraction together is the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. When the electrical signal is gone, after the signal is ended, and the um, nervous system is no longer telling the muscle to relax, to contract, we don't see any red, um, lightning bolt arrows here because the action potential is gone, the signal is gone. And without that electrical signal, the calcium stops being released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and instead gets pumped back in. Now, actually, there's always a pump going, pushing the calcium into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. But when the electrical signal is pre present, uh, channels open up and allow calcium out, and more calcium comes out than can get pumped back in. And so it's effectively just all coming out. But once those ch 
channels close, no more calcium can get out, and the pumps then are going to effectively clear the calcium out of uh, the sarcoplasm or the cytoplasm. And calcium is released from the uh, troponin molecule, and tropomyosin moves back in to block where actin and then myosin will bind. Myosin no longer is going to grab onto it, and the thin filaments slide back out the other way. Okay. And we get relaxation. <clears throat> That's essentially what's happening in contraction. My pointing to some very static pictures and talking through it is not probably very helpful. So instead, I want to move on to show you a couple of videos. Oh, uh, I'm about to get to show you a couple of videos. I forgot. I have one more thing to show you. Um, <clears throat> previously, I just said calcium's in there, uh, troponin and tropomyosin move, and myosin binds and bends, causes contraction. What actually happens in um, uh, the sliding filaments, the, the energy dependent movement that actually slides the thick thin filaments on the thin filaments, is driven by um, the myosin heads going through a series of changes, which are broken down into four steps. Um, the myosin head binds to actin, which is called a cross bridge. So cross bridge is formed, and then the energy that it gets from ATP is used to cause it to move, which is called a power stroke. And then after it's moved and it's pushed the thin film along, it lets go, grabs a new ATP to hydrolyze that, and returns back to its original position here, having hydrolyzed the ATP. And then it's just going to go back up here, forming a cross bridge, power stroke, detach the cross bridge, and then recover back to its starting position. And just go over and over again. Again, Kind of hard to get a sense of in a static picture, so I'm going to show you a couple of videos. The first video is specifically about those four steps. Okay? And then the second video is going to put everything together, kind of. So before this starts actually playing, uh, let me say a couple of things. First off, um, <clears throat> You can see there's a, a logo there saying Pierce and Benjamin Cummings. Um, it's now presently covered up by the uh, progress bar at the bottom, but it also says copyright, whatever, uh, Pearson Education. Um, <clears throat> Pearson Education is the publishing house that makes the book that I'm not making you buy for this course. Okay. Um, if you were to have bought the book, you would have gotten an access code to go online and get to some additional material that they have. And that additional material includes this and the other video I'm about to show you. You can see that this says part three, so there's three videos that have to do with muscle contraction. This, I'm going to show you this part three, and then we're going to look at part two. We're not going to see part one. Now the reason why we're looking at these is that these are actually on YouTube. Um, Pearson did not publish them to YouTube. They're published within a private channel, or not a private channel, but a personal, individual person's channel, who I believe is an a &P instructor. And so she took these videos and posted them on YouTube so that her students could see them or something like that. That is actually a flagrant violation of copyright. Okay? Um, but <coughs> um, if Pearson were to tell Google, who owns YouTube, that somebody's posted my copyrighted material, uh, please take it down, Google would take it down immediately. And they haven't. Okay? Which, to me, satisfies an implicit uh, permission for this to be on YouTube. Legally, I have no standing. If somebody were to take me into um, court and say that I've violated copyright here or something like that, um, I have no legal leg to stand on to say, well, they didn't take it off YouTube, and they should have taken it off YouTube. Still copyrighted, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the person that posted it uh, would probably be standing beside me in court. But um, I don't have a big problem with doing this for two reasons. One, 
um, we give them plenty of money from this school because mm -hmm. all of our other AMP2 students are paying out buttloads of money to buy their books. Um, and I'm just not making you pay that money. Um, two, not everything is available online. These two videos are part one of this series and a bunch of other videos that they have are not available easily online. If you really like this video and the next one, you want to see more of this type of stuff, then you have to pay them to see it. And so I'll give them a plug uh, that if you do like these videos and you think they'd be helpful, you can go to Pearson and buy access to the online material. Okay. It's cheaper than buying the book, but it's a lot more expensive than our book, and a lot more expensive than just watching what's on YouTube. So, but it is there. Okay, so I'm going to play this. The contraction of a skeletal muscle generates the force necessary to move the skeleton. A contraction is triggered by a series of molecular events known as the crossbridge cycle. In a skeletal muscle fiber, the functional unit of contraction is called the sarcomere. A sarcomere shortens when myosin heads in thick myofilaments form cross bridges with actin molecules in thin myofilaments. The formation of a cross bridge is initiated when calcium ions released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum bind to troponin. This binding causes troponin to change shape. Tropomyosin moves away from the myosin binding sites on actin, allowing the myosin head to bind actin and form a cross bridge. Also note that the myosin head must be activated before a cross bridge cycle can begin. This occurs when ATP binds to the myosin head and is hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. The energy liberated from the hydrolysis of ATP activates the myosin head, forcing it into the cocked position. A crossbridge cycle may be divided into four steps. Step 1. Crossbridge formation. The activated myosin head binds to actin, forming a crossbridge. Inorganic phosphate is released and the bond between myosin and actin becomes stronger. Step two, the power stroke. ADP is released and the activated myosin head pivots, sliding the thin myofilament toward the center of the sarcomere. Step three, cross bridge detachment. When another ATP binds to the myosin head, the link between the myosin head and actin weakens and the myosin head detaches. Step four, reactivation of the myosin head. ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. The energy released during hydrolysis reactivates the myosin head, returning it to the cocked position. As long as the binding sites on actin remain exposed, the crossbridge cycle will repeat. And as the cycle repeats, the thin myofilaments are pulled toward each other and the sarcomere shortens. This shortening causes the whole muscle to contract. Crossbridge cycling ends when calcium ions are actively transported back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Troponin returns to its original shape allowing tropomyosin to glide over and cover the myosin binding site on actin. Okay. Um. Oh. Uh. Hopefully I'll be able to do this within, yeah. Um, now I want to point out a few things about uh, what the video is saying here, um, or showing here actually. 
Uh, first off, uh, these are really nice videos. Um, some little corner of me feels a little bit guilty that we're not paying for seeing these, but I'm uh, more happy that you're not paying a bunch of money for books. Um, the uh, easily accessible sliding filament uh, animation that we watched earlier is really just a very simplified version of what we're looking at here. Okay, The thin filaments are the kind of yellowish part, and the thick filaments are the red. Uh, and we can see the myosin heads moving and pulling the Z disc from either side in towards the middle. Okay. It's the exact same concept that was shown there, just more structurally accurate. Um, so it's kind of nice how it shows that. When it zooms in and it shows us what's happening uh, up close, one thing I want to point out is the representation of troponin here shows troponin as having three subunits. And um, you can kind of see a little dimple on one of them, which is where the calcium ions, these purple things, are going to actually attach. That's troponin C that the calcium actually binds to. Um, but when it does bind to that Oh, Sarcoplasmic oh. reticulum bind to troponin. Sorry. This binding causes troponin. Okay. I was thinking I was in YouTube and using the keyboards to manipulate it, but can't do that. So, um, okay, so there's where troponin binds to calcium and it moves troponin, I mean, and tropo tropomyosin out of the way so that myosin can bind to the uh, binding site there. Now, um, oh, come on. So the video goes through the four steps and describes those. I wrote them up on the board here with one sort of difference. Um, in the video, when it gets to step four, it calls that, shoot, I can't remember now what they say. Um, reactivation of the myosin head. Um, I instead refer to that as the recovery stroke. Um, the reason I do that is because uh, I wanted to just make a general point about um, what's going on in this cross bridge cycle. Uh, and also to kind of explain why it's called the power stroke. What's going on here is kind of the same thing that happens in any kind of motor, okay, any kind of motion. Uh, powered motion is going to be based on this same sort of thing. Okay. Not exactly. The cross bridge part is a little unique to this, but uh, usually there's going to be a four step process. Um, I could describe this for an internal combustion engine, which makes your car move, uh, provided you don't have a Prius or something like that. Um, but uh, a little explosion of gas vapor pushes a piston in one direction, which causes the transmission no. drive. Okay, I'm not really good on cars, um, but it kind of follows all this. The stuff. Gear. Sorry. The gear. Yeah, it's, I guess that's in the transmission. But let me stick with something I'm a little bit better at describing, which is paddling a canoe. Okay. So let's say this is my paddle. Um, when you paddle a canoe, you put the blade in the water. You push, which actually moves you forward. You take the blade out of the water, you move it forward, you put it back in the water, and you go like this. Now, of course, you don't stop in between. It's not like you move this far and your canoe sits there idle while you're you kind of actually moves. But that's a four step process, which is exactly right here. Okay? The cross bridge formation is when the paddle goes into the water, okay? the paddle connects to the water. The power stroke is when you actively pull the paddle back, okay. which is what creates the motion, pushes the, the canoe forward. And then cross bridge detachment is when you pull the paddle out of the water. And then recovery stroke is when you pull, move the paddle back to the forward position before you put it in the water. Okay. Now, what I'm doing here is actually not the most efficient paddling stroke. Um, what I'm leaving out, which is very important, is the recovery stroke involves an interesting little twist, so to speak. Uh, when you pull the paddle out of the water, you also rotate it about 90 degrees. 
Why would this be advantageous? For air resistance? Right. If you have the paddle in this position, you have the broad, flat space of the paddle pushing against the air. Okay. And that's going to make it a little bit more, uh, well, it's going to increase the drag. It's going to take more effort to push the paddle forward. Maybe not a whole lot of effort. If you're just out paddling for fun, you wouldn't really notice it. But if you're doing it uh, as a serious paddler, that makes a big difference. It's going to tire you out faster. So you rotate the paddle like this so it slices through the air with the thin face forward, which cuts down on the air resistance. Okay. And then you rotate it back and you put the flat paddle into the water so then you have resistance as the water's pushing, I mean, the paddle's pushing into the water. And that's how you get the greatest movement forward. Okay. Now I'm making that point because that's the recovery stroke. And what happens in a recovery stroke is that uh, for the myosin is that the myosin head, which just bent forward like this, doesn't just go backwards the same way. It drops down a little bit and slides back out of the way so it doesn't run into the thin filament and push it the other direction. And you can kind of see that reactivation of the myosin. Oh, no, it already happened. I can't catch it. I'm not going to try to catch the frame and show it again here, but um, if you watch the video, you will see that the myosin head moves forward and then in the recovery stroke or reactivation, it dips down a little bit so that it doesn't run back into the thin filament when it's getting back to its original position. And that's important because it's not going to work against the effort that's been uh, put into making the thin filament move one direction. It's not going to push the thin filaments back the other way. Um, Oh, okay, I could have kept playing. It does actually show it happening. Uh, okay, um, if you go back to watch this, this little segment right here where it's going from that look at one uh, myosin head and then it sort of flies down the length of the, the myosin filament here. This is really good because you can see that the myosin heads actually move independently. And that's important. The uh, animation I showed you earlier of the sliding filament by itself, all of the myosin heads moved at the same time. But actually they should all be moving independently. Because there has to be at least one connected to the thin filament at all times holding it in position or moving it towards the center. If all of the myosin heads disconnected at the same time, then the thin filament, because of the elasticity of the uh, muscle fiber, the thin filament would slide back out and you'd get relaxation. You'd lose the contractile force. So there's always got to be something connected to it. And this segment in the video actually makes a good point of it if you know what to look for. So like this head right here is in a different position than this head, or this head, or this head, or this head. They're all going through their particular cross bridge cycle events at their own, well, not at their own pace. They're all doing it at the same pace. They're just doing it uh, out of sequence with each other. So that there's always something connected to the thin filament, and the thin filament can't slide back the other way and relax the muscle. So um, I just want to point those things out about what's going on here. This was part three for the muscle contraction videos. I want to show you part two here. Typically. Which is called uh, excitation contraction coupling. Um, I could have shown you this first and the powers that be at Pearson that put them together thought that this particular video should come first. It just this video glosses over the stuff I just told you. It just says, and there's contraction. I'd rather show you the contraction and then put that into the greater picture of what's happening overall. Okay. And in our book, uh, they introduce the idea of, inter of excitation contraction coupling before they get to talking about sliding filaments and, and contraction and all that. Again, I think that's a little bit out of order. But So let me play this video. I think it's a pretty good representation of the whole concept. A single motor neuron arising in the brain or spinal cord conducts action potentials that travel to hundreds of skeletal muscle fibers within a muscle. 
The sequence of events that converts action potentials in a muscle fiber to a contraction is known as excitation-contraction coupling. If we look at a single muscle fiber, we see that an action potential travels across the entire sarcolemma and is rapidly conducted into the interior of the muscle fiber by structures called transverse tubules. Transverse, or T-tubules, are regularly spaced in foldings of the sarcolemma that branch extensively throughout the muscle fiber. At numerous junctions, the T-tubules make contact with the calcium-storing membranous network known as the sarcoplasmic reticulum, or SR. Where it abuts the T-tubule, the SR forms sac-like bulges called terminal cisterni. One portion of a T-tubule plus two adjacent terminal cisterni is known as a triad. The membranes of the T-tubule and terminal cisterni are linked by a series of proteins that control calcium release. As an action potential travels down the T-tubule, it causes a voltage-sensitive protein to change shape. This shape change opens a calcium release channel in the SR, allowing calcium ions to flood the sarcoplasm. This rapid influx of calcium triggers a contraction of the skeletal muscle fiber. Thus, calcium ions are responsible for the coupling of excitation to the contraction of skeletal muscle fibers. Okay, so... Um, the SR forms... Uh, let me go back and talk about a few things here. Um, <clears throat> this sequence in here is kind of nice because... Um, oh. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, this sequence is kind of nice because it shows a little bit better how the uh, T tubules and the sarcoplasmic reticulum is kind of wrapped around all of those um, myofibrils. Uh, and I'm going to try for a second to try to get a good frame to show this. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> here are the T tubules. And uh, Here's where they are coming in from the sarcoplasma, uh, the cell membrane, and they go deep inside the cell. Now the shape that we see here, each of these openings here represent where a myofibril would be going through. Okay. And wrapped around the myofibril, what's currently kind of ghosted out of the image right now, so you can't see it, um, is the sarcoplasmic particulum extending between the T2. So all of that's wrapped around the myosin fibril. And uh, so I, this is as close as I'm going to get to getting a, a good frame of this. But the glowing that they have here represents that action potential, that uh, red um, <clears throat> lightning bolt arrow that I was showing you from the pictures from the book. It's represented here by glowing. And so here the membrane is glowing because that's where the electrical signal is located. And then the T tubules here are glowing because the signal travels inside of the um, cell through the T tubules to get up to where the myofibrils are and the sarcoplasmic reticulum is. And then it, it defines the triad and all that stuff somewhere in here. Okay, so it's talking about the triad, and then it shows you between the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the triad, there's a connection of these proteins, which are a voltage-sensitive calcium channel. Now, voltage is electrical activity, and so when that electrical signal comes through, it... Uh, Okay, I'm not going to try to catch this frame because it's impossible to get perfectly, but uh, as they were animating this, this little glowing ring sort of moved along the T-tubule and it passed right here. Uh, the part of this 
representation of the channel, which it, to me it kind of looks like a flower pot with a flower in it. And so the flower part of this uh, is sensitive to the voltage, sensitive to the electrical signal in the T tubule. And when it passes by, that changes its shape. And when it changes shape, it causes the flower pot part, which is actually the channel, to open up. And then calcium will come out. So here we see, uh, previously we were just looking at the membrane of the cerebrospinal reticulum and the membrane of the T tubes that were transparent, so you can see inside of them, but actually uh, they're barriers, they're compartments. We can't get in there, we can't get in there. But when the electrical charge moves through the T tubule, that stuff changes and then calcium spills out. And now it's spilling out in that gap, you know, little crevice between the two and the calcium gets out where it can then get to um, the uh, troponin C subunit, causing that to change shape, and trop tropomyosin moves out of the way, and all of this can happen. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> and then they just sort of back out and show you know, things at larger and larger scale. But it's really what's happening there, that electrical signal getting in and causing calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum uh, makes this possible. Calcium has to be present so that the cross bridge can form in the first place. And as long as calcium is present, the myosin heads will just cycle through this over and over again. When the electrical signal has gone and the calcium is gone, this ends. Okay. Uh, now. Important point to mention, but kind of minor in how it's presented in the material we've looked at so far. Well, I think actually the the Crossbridge cycle video we just looked at might have said it. Um, ATP is hydrolyzed by the myosin head late in the cycle. I think it happens during Crossbridge attachment. And so um, the recovery, the myosin head in recovery has that chemical energy ready to power movement at the power stroke. If calcium is removed from the system, it stops here. Okay, So the myosin head is charged up with the chemical energy from ATP, waiting for calcium to show up again so they can form a new cross bridge. And as soon as that happens, the energy is already present for the power stroke to take place, which is just to say that when your muscles contract, when you send a signal from your brain to your muscles to tell them to contract and excitation gets all of this started, they contract immediately because they're primed and ready to go just waiting for the excitation signal to release the calcium so that the calcium will allow this to start happening. So as soon as calcium shows up, the cross bridge forms and the power stroke starts immediately because it's already got the energy to do that. And then it gets more energy for the next time, and it just cycles through over and over again until the calcium is gone. Um, a sort of interesting aspect of this, uh, which I'm not going to explain entirely correctly, and if you find it interesting, feel free to investigate a little bit further. But because of that, the ATP being hydrolyzed um, <clears throat> late in the cycle, uh, that actually leads to rigor mortis. Okay, what is rigor mortis? It's when your body stiffens up after death. Right. Rigor mortis is when muscles get into a locked contraction phase after death. And the reason that happens is because when you're dead and your cells are no longer making ATP, um, <coughs> the crossword cycle can't continue through but the ATP that was hydrolyzed at the end of the last time, whatever muscle contracted, is still present. And so uh, in the process is leading to death. Um, I imagine calcium is released from a sarcoplasmic reticulum or something like that. Something happens, and so one last cross bridge cycle forms. Okay. And so the energized uh, myosin heads can cause contraction. But then there's nothing else there. There's no new ATP so that they can detach 
and let the, the muscles relax. So rigor mortis, when the muscles actually contract after death, is because they're already primed to contract. But being dead, the cells won't allow the cross-fit cycle to complete and allow the muscle to relax again. So it's actually kind of tied in that. So uh, with that, have a nice Halloween. Um, I, this is a good place to start. I'm not going to fill the last four minutes here trying to say a few other things. We'll pick up from here and talk about what happens at the whole muscle level uh, next week.